YWCA Hartford region, where we are continuing our Week Without Violence campaign with our Facebook Live series. So welcome to our third night of our Facebook Live series, where tonight we're talking about activating advocacy, accessing resources on college campuses, and learning where we can take action. So tonight, I'm thrilled to have three wonderful panelists. We have... My name is Raina Dighton White. I am the Title IX Coordinator for University of St. Joseph. I'm also the Diversity Director. My name is Laura Lockwood. I run the Women and Gender Resource Action Center at Trinity College, otherwise known as YBRAC. Hi, I'm Sam McCarthy. I'm a junior at Trinity College. I work for a bystander intervention program that's new to Trinity called Green Dot. I'm also involved with the Interval House in Hartford. Wonderful. So thank you all for coming. And I know our viewers are going to be really excited to hear about what they're able to do, especially those of college age, what we can do on college campuses, specifically because that's our focus um, this year. So you all are advocates in your own way and how you deal with domestic violence, intimate partner violence. So if you all could just talk a little bit about how you um, encounter these types of, of situations, what is your role in helping that and as a resource or as someone who works with this type of issue every day? Okay. Um, I, I'd like to just clarify one, one thing. thing. Yeah, yes. of course. As the Title IX coordinator, we're not campus advocates. We're actually the people who oversee the enforcement of sexual misconduct policies, and that encompasses intimate partner violence. Um, however, absolutely, we provide accommodations for parties. Um, we conduct the investigations. People can file complaints um, under our current federal rules and guidelines. College campuses are on what's called a constructive notice standard. Therefore, even if we receive information from a third party, we still have an obligation to look into it. And this is really important when it comes to intimate partner violence. Um, it oftentimes is the bystander, is the individual who is friends or observing something that puts us on our first alert that we may have something to address. Um, I think one of the most important aspects of that is really creating an open air community, um, trying to create as many resources as possible on a campus and understanding that not everybody's gonna wanna walk into an administrator's office. So you really wanna make sure that you've empowered students, you've empowered other administrators, even your faculty, to understand how to recognize those signs, as well as have a really open mindset if they think they've got a student or even a colleague um, that needs assistance. Perfect, thank right. you. Laura, you wanna to add to what you do on sure. Trinity's thank campus? You. Yeah, Trinity, um, my role is multifaceted. Um, I'm an educator, we educate the student body and the entire campus around issues of sexual misconduct, um, which includes intimate partner violence um, in terms of what to be aware of, what it is, the red flags of an unhealthy relationship or an abusive relationship, um, what the resources are. And we do this through very creative ways because it's a college campus and so um, straight lectures are really not going to go over as well. Um, so there's student organizations that we advise that, um, that hold events during the year. Um, everything from Take Back the Night to Voices Raised in Power to the Red Flag Campaign, which raises awareness but also um, talks about bystander intervention and also resources. So that's part, that's one hat that I wear. And then the other hat, well, there's a few, but one of them is um, I meet with students who are victims or survivors um, of intimate partner violence and all types of sexual misconduct. Um, I'm known as a confidential employee, which means that students, faculty or staff who come to me um, know that information that they give me will go to the Title IX coordinator, but not their names and not the name of the person who's harmed them. So unless they request that. So as a confidential employee, um, which is what the title is, I am um, very accessible to many, many students. And over the, I've been there over two decades and I've worked with countless students who have been um, involved in intimate partner violence um, or abusive relationships. And, um, and they're very, very complex and it's extremely underreported for many reasons that we might get into later. 
Um, and I also have worked on policy and I've also supported and advocated for students when they go through investigations of the crimes, um, as well as helping families of, the, um, of both parties, as well as um, just supporting the students throughout their time at, at Trinity or their time through an investigation. So quite a few different roles. Awesome. And we also, I'm sorry, we also um, has the the prevention and education strategy. So we do um, an incredible amount of training and education. Um, some of it's required, some of it's not, um, and you know, all in terms of a strategy of um, creating a campus where this um, where violence is not tolerated, as well as where people have each other's back and will. Um, step in if needed and Sam can tell you a lot more about that. Yeah so on campus since my first year I got involved with a program called Green Dot which is a bystander intervention program that works to prevent violence from happening on campus specifically focusing on sexual assault, intimate partner violence, and stalking and from the minute I heard about the program I thought that this was something that I needed to get involved with. Um, Green Dot really operates under the idea that everyone on campus is responsible for changing the campus culture. So it empowers all students, no matter male, female, student of color, high socioeconomic status, every single person on campus, including faculty, staff, administration, is involved in Green Dot. So we do trainings outside of just students and especially outside of just first year students. Green Dot takes, under, takes into account the idea that student leaders and students with social capital are the ones who really are able to make change on campus. So we do a lot of different trainings. One of them is just a um, general overview of the training and then we do a longer bystander intervention training. And all of these trainings are optional right now. Um, we're still in the implementation phase, so we're on our second year, and Green Dot really takes students who want to be involved and want to change the campus and allows them to do that in a way that they're a student leader and they're employing these bystander intervention techniques out on campus. And as a student, you know that this happens, you see it happen, you know people who it happens to, and you know people who are the perpetrators, and I think that being aware of that, acknowledging that, and doing something about it is something that Green Dot really tries to make happen at Trinity, and so I think that hopefully making strides as we get closer to full implementation. Perfect. Thank you all for, for sharing that. I think it's great that we have a great spectrum here that we're able to see from prevention and all the way through reporting these types of incidents. Um, it's great that we can see the variety of how this issue is touched. Um, so I think with that, we did a little bit on the other night of our Facebook Live series about intimate partner violence and domestic violence and well, what it is. But if you guys could elaborate a little bit more, I would love to have you share um, what are the signs, what are the reporting things. I think it's great to reiterate it, but as well see the different ways we see it, especially in your different roles, um, what you see as the signs and um, particularly if, you know, with reporting, what we see um, the most common things um, with intimate partner violence and domestic violence, and I think you can elaborate a little bit on the differences. Um, <clears throat> um, intimate partner violence um, versus domestic violence is um, a technicality. We've gone from the term domestic violence to intimate partner violence so that we can really recognize that people can be in violent relationships even though they don't live together. Mm -hmm. um, this was a technicality that existed um, for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think the younger generation uh, fortunately didn't really have, you guys really have to come into yeah. that, but there was a time when people would say, they don't live together so there's no domestic violence. Mm -hmm. But you had couples who were fighting. Mm -hmm. You know, you had people who were clearly being hurt. Um, you also had incidences where roommates were put under the domestic violence umbrella. Um, th these are antiquated thoughts. Mm -hmm. What we're really looking for are people who are in some form of an amorous relationship who are engaging in unhealthy relationship behaviors and they need not be physical. Uh, let's be very clear. Nobody takes somebody out on a first date, hangs out for the first date, 
and you come across and smack this person, hit them, hurt them. That's not how that goes. Um, it doesn't mean that physical violence can't qu quickly escalate within a relationship, but oftentimes what you have um, is a very intricate pattern of behavior that begins. It can start off very light. Um, I think a lot of us are very familiar with the um, typical signs, right? Don't go out with friends, please stay here with me. But it can be really, really small in the beginning. It can be as small as every time we do something, I choose the activity. And that may seem very endearing and caring at first, um, but what happens once you're at activities you don't want to be at? What about the ability to have an opinion? Um, when we look at things like the Red Flag Campaign, when we look at Green Dot, these are the attempts to really educate um, our younger generation, but the public in general. And, and one of the things I like about college campuses is we do get to educate faculty and staff. Right. I like that, right? Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> we don't get stuck in last century. We stay right here and say, these are unhealthy relationship behaviors. And that's what we really need to recognize and understand, that power, that control, that manipulation, and recognizing that at first, that power, control, and manipulation doesn't look like this. It doesn't look or feel like this. It's very soft. And it's why by the time you get into physical violence, into um, you know the person wearing the sweater and it's 85 degrees and the classroom doesn't have air conditioning and they're sitting there stock still, um, why you can have that because you build your way up into that behavior. You build your way up into that isolation, into the name calling. And it can start with something as small as, you know, hey, listen, um, when I come over, do you mind, you know, if um, you can have something ready for me? Um, we can even work it out. We can split the bill. I get out of classes and I'm really hungry. Can you have something ready? And that seems like a nice request, right? Mm -hmm. What happens when that goes from, really? I'm in class all day long and you can't get me something to eat? Is it that hard for you to pull your act together? Mm -hmm. Those are the things that usually by the time we're in that, oh, it's an argument, oh, it's a fight, oh, it's not that bad, oh, she didn't mean it, oh, he didn't mean it, they had a hard day. But green dot, red flag, intimate campus communities give people a very unique opportunity to intervene, to support that individual. And with intimate partner violence on a college campus, mm -hmm. the same way it can be difficult to sometimes seek out resources because the campus is small. You know, let's bear in mind that a large campus community is what, 60,000 people? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an average sized town, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the same way that people sometimes worry about seeking out those resources, I really want any of our viewers here and anyone in the community to understand that you are also very much surrounded by staff, by friends, by students who are probably seeing your situation and want to help. Um, that's what we're looking at with intimate partner violence. We're looking at this pattern of behavior. Mm -hmm. We're looking at small things that lead their way into the ability to become physically violent, to become emotionally berating, to become controlling. Um, so the signs and things that I look out for in isolation, do we have students who, you know, we're out and about and all of a sudden we can't find them? You know, um, they stop going to class. Um, usage of financial resources. I, I cannot stress that enough. Do you have this person's meal card and you won't give it back? Are you driving this person around campus no matter what? Do you pick them up or do they just simply have your car, your credit card? Um, one, one thing that I saw once was, um, the refusal to let somebody pay their tuition bill and instead an argument about how they needed that money. Huh. And they're both students. I mean, isn't school the crux of everything right now, right? <laughs> um, you know, but, but an argument over paying a tuition bill. And, and that can sound ludicrous to all of us. Right here, we're safe, we're comfortable. But that, that, that truly happened. Um, and, and, and bear in mind what must have preceded that so that the other person sat still and went through that discussion and argument instead of going, no, I gotta go pay my tuition bill, you know, and, and, and feeling comfortable enough mm -hmm. to do that. So I really think we should understand that intimate partner violence isn't just about the physical violence. We're really dealing with a very intricate web of behaviors that builds us up to that. And mm -hmm. if you've ever thought about a cobweb, 
One looks fine, right? <laughs> One's not that bad. It's in the corner. Oh, it'll keep the flies away. Think about webs as they start to expand, as they start to grow. At that point, you have someone who is oftentimes entangled in something mm -hmm. that to us may seem very simple to get out of, but it's not. Um, all of our roles here are oftentimes to come in and not tell a person, this is easy, you can stop this whenever you want to. Mm -hmm. You guys don't even live together, are you serious? Well, listen, we'll put a no contact order between the two of you and then it will be done with. It's really about taking um, both parties for the work that I do, you know, um, helping them come to terms with what is, yes, doing the adjudication, but then recognizing the accommodations that they need may go beyond extensions of class time, may go beyond moving schedules, but really helping that individual to get out of that web, mm -hmm. to feel comfortable and confident enough to really move forward, to seek us out, to talk to us. I do like to try to have strong relationships with, um, with our other administrative mm -hmm. staff as well as faculty who um, are advocates, our counselors, um, our student groups even. It, it's usually by that point that, that people are aware. While we keep the confidentiality, um, we oftentimes as Title IX coordinators do work within a small circle so that we're keeping an eye out. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, the, the signs can, can be all over the place, but once you know that you've got that student who needs help, it doesn't have to just be intimate partner violence. You know, reach out. You never know what's, what's kind of behind that, what's underneath that surface. Thank you, and thank you for giving those examples. I think that's a great way to highlight, especially not everything comes right to mind when you're thinking these subtle things. So I think that's really important for our viewers to understand. Laura, did you have any other? Yeah, I was uh, just thinking in terms of, <clears throat> In terms of resources on a college campus, um, something, you know, a small college campus it could be as small as Trinity or, or a little bit larger, um, St. Joseph's. But um, I think what's really important is, is to remember, A, how, um, how incredibly hard it is to come forward um, with this if you are a member of the LGBTQI plus community, it's, the incidence is much higher. Um, of intimate partner violence and the reporting is much lower because of the shame and the stigma on top of um, the marginalization um, that students experience um, on top of fear of being outed um, on top of the fear of being hurt in a worse way as well as having um, I'm sorry, and as well as for students who are from marginalized communities. So at, at Trinity, that would be um, non-majority, non-white, non non-Christian, non-heterosexual, um, um, non-rich. So of which there are many, many students at Trinity. And when you're marginalized or um, in, a, in a tight community, in a small, like a small town or however you want to talk about it, um, the resources you want you want to see people that look like you that or that identify with the same gender identity or expression or that um, that practice the same faith as you or that you know um, yeah, that have that have your background or are first gen first generation or their first language is not English so what we've tried really really hard to do and it's not always easy um, is to try to create a community of resources at Trinity um, and I know other colleges have worked really hard to do this as well where where representation of the, of the groups of all groups are, um, are present on our what we, we have what's called a sexual assault resource team, um, and before some of the um, Title IX um, changes from the Obama administration or the guidance, that was the team of about 25 administrators and faculty who were uber trained and were um, and who made up of and who were representative of all the groups I've talked about. Um, now with um, with the guidance from Obama's administration, all the, the entire uh, faculty and staff are what are called responsible employees, which means that they are mandated reporters, except for a few of us who have different levels of, um, of confidentiality. But what's important about that is that 
everybody now has the training to be able to, um, to take disclosures. So the reason I'm ex explaining all that is because I think that because such a small fraction of um, victims and survivors come forward with these um, crimes, um, and because they're so complex, the relationships, the ones I've dealt with have just been um, incredibly, incredibly difficult in terms of they not only involve the abuse and the power and the manipulation and the control, but different forms of abuse, whether it's economic, whether it's emotional, whether it's physical, whether um, um, in, or in different manipulative, coercive ways of treating somebody. Um, but it also includes different types of sexual violence. So it would include rape as well as, um, as, well as intimate partner violence. So that, I mean, so students may not, um, they may come forward about the sexual assault, but will not talk about the rest of the, what's going on in the rest of the relationship. And it may get coded that way or, or tracked that way at a college. And we have to um, file with the federal government every year, clear statistics that say this is how many, you know, crimes we've had under sexual misconduct. It's so complex. And so I think what's really important is for the campus to be highly educated in this, especially those who are going to be um, either first responders or resources for the students. Um, we try really hard. I brought, I brought this. Um, so this is called Your Rights, Your Options, and this is a... Um, what we make sure every student has on campus. It's our, um, it's about a 10 page information guide on Title IX rights, Title IX options, and this is for victim survivors and the accused, so this is for all parties. Um, and it's basically outlines in detail resources on and off campus, where to find them, who they are, how to reach them, um, what rights you have under Title IX for both, um, for all parties involved. Um, what bystander intervention is, we have a special, um, we have a page that's for male identified students for LGBTQ plus and resources um, on and off campus for students of color. So um, it's something that we take extremely seriously. Um, we list all the definitions in here so students and students are often can't name what's going on but they know something is wrong and so we help them with not only definitions from our policy but real life examples um, that students can say oh okay that's what's happening to me so I guess what I'm trying to say is the more campuses do to um, get this information into everybody's hands. It's online, it's very accessible, um, and make sure that students have people who look like them, who are like them, who they can go to, who they can trust and feel comfortable with. I think that's a huge obstacle that campuses can address. Do you mind if I just add one thing to this? Um, as, um, <clears throat> as someone who, who has done Title IX work in um, Previously, I worked for the state of Connecticut in the Office of Policy Management, and I managed the Violence Against Women Act um, federal funding that came in and flowed down. Um, when we talk about resources, one of the things, I love our state system, okay? I will blatantly say, yes, I'm an attorney. I'm one of those crazy people that has a copy of the Constitution in their <laughs> pocketbook. You know, go civics. Um, <laughs> it's important. But um, what I really wanted to add to this was the policy piece. For everyone out there, especially my nutmakers here in Connecticut, um, what Laura just discussed here, do you mind if I... Yeah, please. Okay. Every Connecticut college campus is supposed to provide you with a concise written notification of your rights and options, okay? So if you are on a Connecticut college campus, private, public, community college, there's some form of this. And the reason is this. 
Our sexual misconduct policies tend to be very long and they need to be for a reason. Um, handing somebody 34, 40, maybe sometimes even 50 pages of a policy after a traumatic incident go, yeah, no, listen, hey, you read this, you'll be fine. Yeah, it was written by a bunch of lawyers and people with PhDs in education administration. You'll be able to get through this, no. Um, one of the things that the state of Connecticut has done, and I really applaud the legislators for doing this, um, as well as Cleary, is say, listen, you have to break it down for folks, okay? So on every college campus is basically an abbreviated version of that policy, and that's what it provides. What your rights are, what your options are, your resources on campus, as well as your community resources. It will also provide you again with basic information in terms of what you want to do. When we say what are your rights, you know, just because we become aware of an incident doesn't mean we have to investigate it. And I think that's something that's very important to know with intimate partner violence. Um, a lot of times our offices run very closely with student conduct. People think, well, you know what, I'm gonna get this person in trouble. That's not our focus. Our focus is really making sure that the individual who is being harmed is accommodated and supported. In my own experience, by accommodating and supporting that person who needs help, they oftentimes feel comfortable enough to then either go through with a formal investigation or they do exit themselves out of the relationship, but that takes support. You know, um, so there are circumstances in which we must investigate. Please understand that. College campuses cannot ignore someone who has been clearly physically injured. Um, if we're talking about transporting an individual to the hospital, if we're talking about police involvement, we still support that individual, but yes, the person who's doing this needs to be put through some form of process. But on all college campuses, no matter what, you should be able to get a copy of this. They're not just held in Title IX offices. They're oftentimes available online. They're oftentimes available in places like the health centers, your resource centers. And you can look through it and start to get an idea of, you know what, what do I want to do, okay? Um, and I just put that out there because I've had people very tearfully say to me, you know, I can't believe I was told on. You know, when you talked about those marginalized groups, that is a big concern. You know, how could you do this to one of us? You know there's only a few of us here on campus. How could you get so-and-so in trouble? It doesn't work that way, and what we should always remember, and the way that we should look at it as someone who comes from a marginalized group and was raised in a same-sex household, that's the person that's violating, okay? We don't owe a duty to somebody that's hurting our very small circles, okay? We're all here, we're in school, we're trying to support each other, even as colleagues. The duty is owed to make sure that whoever is in our group, that we are supporting and caring and taking care of one another. If you have someone hurting another individual, that's the individual that we really need to look at and say, okay, where does our loyalty lie? Yeah. And I'm not saying that you guys engage in social ousting, but please do not go and confront people that we know need help like that, okay? Confront them with love, confront them with support, you can come to us, we're more than happy to help with that, okay? Um, because I know that's a big, <laughs> that can be difficult sometimes, right? Um, but also, as a Title IX coordinator, I'm looking at acts, okay, not the actor. Your sexual status, um, how you present, what you were born as, what you choose to call yourself, that's not what the focus is. The focus is do I have an act that violates a policy? Do I have an act that puts another individual in harm's way? And again, it can be difficult to work through, but your rights, your options, again, so many different versions of this, but on every college campus in Connecticut, there is one. All right. Sorry, I just had to yes. make that little plug and say, listen, That's, you know. It's so important to get that out there. Yeah. I was just gonna add as a student, um, especially with the your rights, your options, it, there's all those definitions in there. And one thing that I've become aware of in my classes, but also through um, friends and people who have experienced different types of sexual misconduct, you're not automatically right off the bat gonna say, I was raped or I was, I'm a victim of intimate partner violence. Those words are not really your first descriptors of the situation that you're in. Victims are more likely to say, 
I was hurt or it wasn't consensual. Something like along those lines, it's a lot more informal. So as someone who's gonna be a resource, even if you're just a friend, if you're aware of these, the best way to approach your friend isn't to say, hey, I think that you were raped. It's, you know, let's sit down and talk about what happened and you tell me and kind of meet them where they're at because coming at them with policies right off the bat is not going to help. And it's not really gonna move them forward or put them in a mindset to come forward. So I think being there first and foremost is somebody that they can talk to in whatever language, whatever ways that they wanna talk about it and however much information that they wanna disclose is very important. Perfect. Thank you all for being able to share that. I think it's so informative, and I think our viewers are really appreciating how we're going about this issue. And I think, Sam, you touched on something that I kind of already wanted to ask about, which is oftentimes we talk about the difficulties of reporting um, as individuals who have been impacted by this, but I think it's also important to know um, a lot of questions come up with us as allies, so we're not directly impacted mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a victim or a survivor of mm -hmm. this, but we're an ally. Um, what is it that we do to help? What is our what is our role there? And I think you kind of touched on that, but you know, we hear these things happening. Do we directly go and report it? Do we directly go and tell it an, an, a mandated reporter? What is our role at, as becoming an ally? Oh, that could be a whole podcast on itself. <laughs> okay. I think, I think you really have to look at your situation and see where you're at. <clears throat> um, so, one, work on your comfort level, right? Like you said, you have to meet the person where they're at. As someone who's looking to do bystanding, if you're looking to really intervene, um, what are you comfortable with? So, um, usually green dot. Um, bystander intervention tends to recognize four different types of techniques that you can use. Um, and if you and several friends are kind of all noticing the same mm -hmm. thing, but you know, hey, nobody's really bold enough to pop out there on their own, don't go it alone. Why? You know, we're a community. Um, you can absolutely sit down and discuss amongst your group of friends. We're worried about so-and-so, what do we wanna do? You know, I think there's a big difference between gossiping but versus everyone coming together mm -hmm. and saying, how can we address this? Um, and that can be with getting resources, looking, and deciding, okay, maybe I want to provide this to a person, mm -hmm. or coming again to those places where you know somebody is going to be able to take responsibility and bring that up the chain. Um, <clears throat> Title IX coordinators, deans, faculty, like you said, in this day and age, we're all cross-trained. Okay, um, everybody should be cross-trained and um, should at least know how to provide a basic response um, as well as then bring that up to that office. What I oftentimes tell people when I'm training is, you know what, let's say you don't like me, right? You don't, like, don't want to go talk to the Title IX coordinator. That's fine. That's fine, right? Seek out your counselor, okay? Seek out that RA or that Res Life director in your hall. They've all been trained. Seek out that dean. Sit down with somebody that you feel comfortable with. So you can have that group approach or you can do that as an individual. I think the other way to be an ally um, is to try to provide that individual with the support that they need. Mm -hmm. It can be very difficult when you have someone who, um, and, and I, I, I shouldn't assume isolation, but it's just such a common feature of intimate partner violence. You know, let them know, you know what? I'll back off, but I'm still here. You can send that text message, hey, how was your day? Mm -hmm. Just checking in on you. You know, um, I think there's also other ways that you can go ahead and, and, and sometimes if you're in the moment, yeah, you can confront the other individual if you feel safe doing so and say, you know what, we see what you're doing. Like, you know this isn't allowed. Um, you know, oftentimes people will look and go, it's not your business, but actually on a college campus it is. On a college campus it is, with that constructive notice it is. So, um, you know, listen, seriously, if you keep this up, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Why don't you go get help? Mm. You know, you confront the individual who's engaging in the poor behavior. They can seek out counseling, services, just as easily as the other person can. Furthermore, um, I think the person who comes and says, you know what, 
I may not have the best behavior when it comes to relationships. I've got a really nasty temper or I've done some things I'm not too proud of. Um, sometimes by going after that individual, and I don't mean going after them in a bad way, but by really pursuing and working with them, if you think about it from that standpoint, you're going to stop way more future occurrences, not just with that individual, but with other relationships as well. Um, so we want to support the person who's on the receiving end of poor behavior. But um, as a Title IX coordinator, I think I'm one of the few folks that actually works with the other side. Sometimes we can go, oh, okay, hey. Um, I, we use the red flag <laughs> campaign on our campus. I'm like, yeah. you know, there's a list of unhealthy versus healthy relationship behaviors. I gotta tell you, you're, you're falling into this column. Would you like to seek out help about that? Um, so there's so many different ways to be an ally. Um, but really, if you can, with your own safety in mind, stick by that person and please remember many of us who work in education have done so because we want to be here i, I mean i like you know it may seem yeah. crazy but i like yeah. my job i love working yeah. with college students i had a job once with an insurance company and that was miserable <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it don't was say their name great company no great company but it wasn't my call mm -hmm. yeah. i'm here because i want to be here Okay, and I really enjoy making sure that young folks are in a healthy, happy place and that you guys do get a lot of the education that previous generations didn't get. Mm -hmm. you know, the best way to be an ally really is to continue to speak up. Even if you can't for that individual, let us know as administrators that we've still got work to do. Thank you. Lauren, do you have anything to add to that? Um, not really. <laughs> it was a very good job. Um, just couple things. Um, allies, try to get to know the resources on campus best as you can so you can be a resource to the resource, you know, so to speak. Yeah. You, you know what's going on, you know where to take somebody, you know what's... And also educate yourself about the, um, about the subject so you can recognize the signs better, so you can... Um, so that students, you know, that you notice okay, he's texted her or she's texted him, you know, 25 times in the last 10 minutes. Is that a red flag? Do, do your friends know that's a red flag? You know, just learning about the subject, learning what, um, what some students are like, oh, that's none of my business, or isn't that cute that he's doing that, or oh, he must be so sweet. And also understanding that, um, Abusers can be very, are usually very clever um, and very charming, um, and it's very difficult for all of us to understand and to recognize sometimes that, you know, the people who, you know, we all have, we, we hold on to like beliefs in our head about who is and who isn't and who, in, in terms of an abusive person, and you know, and we have these photos in our head that we need to get rid of the myths around this and so understanding that people who engage in um, abusive behaviors usually do not want to be caught um, will um, will sort of you know um, seduce people or groom people into positions where they feel that they are loved so deeply only by this and can only be loved by this person because the abuser um, lets them know that they're not pretty enough or thin enough or X enough for anybody else, but but for me, you're you're perfect, but nobody else is gonna love you except for me, and so you try to leave me knowing you're gonna be alone for the rest of your life. You know, this sort of very, very um, um, sort of subtly abusive um, conditioning to the point where somebody um, doesn't believe that they deserve anything but the abuse that they get and doesn't do not think that they could ever go with anybody else. And I know in a way I went off on a trajectory here, but I think the more that you educate yourself around what these situations tend to look like, the more as an ally you'll be you'll be so aware and then you will educate your friends about it as well. Um, and then you will be able to help more people. No, you're right about that. We do need to break the stereotype around the profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, time. You know, as I said, I've, I've done criminal defense work previously. Um, I used to write criminal appeals, um, worked in the Office of Policy and Management. Um, you're absolutely correct. Um, and, and most people go, 
I, I've gotten to engage in intimate work with people who oftentimes lie on the other side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're not looking at some disheveled deviant. Nobody's going to date that person, right? We're not talking about some hulking, crazed figure that's going to pop out of the blue. <laughs> nobody's going on a date with that person, right? Nobody's dating them. They might. Right? Yeah, I mean, we're talking yeah. about people that usually come in. I mean, oh. they are Sunday clean, okay? Yeah hair done, okay. you know, they smell nice, everything is perfect and together. Um, and, and that's what can even be so difficult for the person when it first starts to happen. You usually are looking at people who are, you know, right. um, in, in great positions of power and, and, and to the outside world, they look great, you know, um, so that can even seem difficult. I think one of the best things to do, um, as we've talked about for that, for allies, yeah, don't be afraid to break the stereotypes. And also, don't be afraid to, you know, to let that person know. I want you to know I see what's behind that mm -hmm. curtain. Mm -hmm. That is so great, but I know what's happening, okay? And you're not going to be alone on the other side mm -hmm. of this, I, I promise you, mm -hmm. right? And they can be women, too, or women identified. I mean, that, that's another thing we don't talk about enough. I mean, I'm a lesbian, and so I'm in a community where I've seen a lot of violence yes. um, and or heard of it, but in terms of believing that that happens, people tend not to believe, you know, women together, they, don't, they wouldn't hurt each other, it's two women. Mm -hmm. So you have that obstacle um, that people you know, must overcome that sort of um, myth again. Um, and women abuse men, so it's not, you know, and outside the binary that we're talking about. So again, we have to educate ourselves um, so we can be there for anybody who, who gets hurt. And I don't want to take away from here <laughs> talking to Yeah, you. so I mean, going off of what you've both said, I've heard students say, oh no, they could never, you know, they're on this team, they do this, they're in this organization, you know, they're so involved, they're so nice, every interaction I've had with them has been nothing but great, I don't, you know, they could never. And I think that as an ally, first and foremost, just saying, I believe you is so important. And then not even talking about how you know the person that might be hurting them, if you do know them. And especially on Trinity's campus, it feels like everybody knows everybody. And just because you might know somebody in a certain way doesn't mean that someone who's closer to them knows them in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all different people around different people. And I think that being so quick to say, no, they could never, is a huge mistake if you're going to be an ally or try and be a resource to somebody. And I think since I've been involved with Green Dot, and I know this booklet pretty much inside and out, saying, you know, hey, even if you're not ready to disclose to somebody where it might be reported, we have privileged employees, which is our chaplain and our counseling center. If you go to the counseling center, they will not disclose that information to anybody. It is absolutely 100% confidential. So there are resources like that on campus. Or if you're just a, a friend or a student and you're not in an RA position or some kind of employee position at the school, you're not mandated to report. But we also have an anonymous reporting system online yeah. where I could report that my friend might be experiencing intimate partner violence. And I might even say, hey, I think I'm going to report this, but I don't need to include your name. And then the school knows that something's happening, mm -hmm. even if they don't have all the information. And even just the fact that the school has some of the information can encourage people to come forward and report later on because they might not have to retell that whole story right off the bat and they feel a little bit more comfortable going in knowing that somebody knows something and that they have an ally on their side who's also involved in that process and I think that first and foremost like I said before just saying I believe you and being someone that they can talk to and then also talking about it I talk about green dot like it's nobody's business and I talk about all of the issues on campus and I think that if we stay silent about it nobody's going to feel comfortable coming forward and nothing's going to change and no one's going to do anything I tell as many people as possible that this is important and I'll explain everything in this and, and green dot and as much information as I can get into other people's heads then the more likely that they are to be a bystander and an ally and help someone or know how to help someone, know the signs when it's happening. And I think 
as a student, those signs of withdrawal and isolation, you can almost see much faster than a professor might or a staff member mm -hmm. because you see, you know, we used to see them in the dining hall all the time and campus spaces where, you know, the faculty and staff members might not be always that evening time, anything like that. Oh, the, I used to see them at this spot in the library all the time and they haven't been there in weeks. Things like that where you know that they're kind of withdrawing, you can kind of say, hey, where have you been a little bit earlier on in that cycle than some faculty and staff might be able to. So being aware as students that, oh, they might not just be busy is really important. Yeah, I do think it's important to check in, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I, I know, um, I think we we're talking, you, you mentioned that Trinity's, why well, I don't know what your, oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what Trinity's numbers are, but St. Joe's is actually a very small campus. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, There's about yeah. 2,000 students. Trinity's campus. I think a, a few more than 2,000. We're a whole 2,500 mm -hmm. with the bulk of that being graduate students. Yes, I mean, yes, there are yes, high schools that yes, are larger, you yes, know, in yes. terms of undergrad. So again, yeah, we're, we're small enough communities, and Connecticut is the third smallest state in the union, okay? Mm -hmm. um, let, let, let's, let's be very clear. There are resources in the community on campuses, you can absolutely reach out. Um, and, and if this is the type of work that you think you have an interest in, if this is just something that you really believe strongly in, we're not a hard system to navigate here. Um, so one, when she mentioned Interval House, and I mentioned that I used to work for the state of Connecticut, um, getting the Violence Against Women Act federal money that comes down to the state, that money goes to Interval House, why? There's one umbrella group that provides domestic violence services. It's called CCADV, the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Interval House, um, all of the women's centers, those shelters that we see all throughout the state, all belong to that larger umbrella organization. <clears throat> they run a hotline, Spanish and English. Um, it's available. What I like about that, and I oftentimes let students know when I'm doing trainings or even addressing them, you don't want to go to Interval House you want to go to Hartford? Fine, fine. You live down in Southern Connecticut? Guess what? The same services are available for you there. Why? Because they all go up to that one main organization. We're all getting trained the same, right? Um, <clears throat> so there are different options. You really can say, you know what? I don't want to involve my campus community. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that can happen sometimes, especially if we've got a victim who feels like they're a public figure, because that can be even harder to come out, right? We, we've seen the stigmatism sometimes levied against people um, in social media or out in the larger community that we feel, well, how did you let that happen? You have money, you have ways out. On a smaller college community, you know, people worry about that. If that's the case, it's not important that we know, it's important that you know how to get help in the community as well as on our campus. And I really also say that to our staff and faculty as well. One of the things that I like about CCADV, the other group for sexual assault is Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence. So when you look at um, SACS of New Britain, when you look at the Merit and Women's Center, when you look at all those different places for sexual assault resources, they all still go back up to the Connecticut Alliance. And those two groups absolutely communicate with each other work together. It's not uncommon, as you stated earlier, that someone will acknowledge the sexual assault but not the domestic violence component. Both of those hotlines, the people who staff them, are certified and trained to do so and to provide cross services. Um, and that really does go for our faculty and staff. I understand why a professor, why a dean, you know, why a, a cabinet <coughs> member might not want to come out to their campus and say, you know, this is what I'm dealing with and I need help but they can still confidentially seek resources in the community. And all college campuses provide that information. Again, if you're on a Connecticut college campus, um, you know, Connecticut Alliance and CCADV have a local advocate that is assigned to you. That again is also state law. So you guys say, go legislators, right? <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's a requirement. All of us have MOUs, memorandums of understanding. In other words, miniature contracts that say, hey, if a student contacts you and makes this disclosure, you're going to provide them with resources. You know, um, so allyship doesn't always have to be in the form of directly confronting. That's not everybody's stick. But 
as you pointed out, it is important that allies or people who want to be allies educate themselves. And here in the state of Connecticut, it's really easy to get that information. Yeah. Did you give out the hotline numbers when? Um, oh, all of the you? hotline numbers will be posted on our okay. website, um, and Good. we can also share them on this post as well. Um, okay, which would be I have perfect. Here, but which yeah. <laughs> well, um, and we have a, we also yeah, yeah, have yeah. Okay, um, just from sure. the YW perspective too. Yeah. We have yeah. all of our brochures. We have all of the websites, um, links to everything um, from information, and we'll certainly have any websites that we have from any of you to be able to put on our website as well, um, just so we can be able to spread the information oh, farther. Really um, so we're close to wrapping up. I just wanted to ask a final question. We've talked a lot about kind of what are the, um, the signs, the signals we see a lot, what are the resources we're doing, which you guys answered perfectly, and I appreciate that. I think our viewers will really like to know all of these places that we can specifically get help at. Um, but where, where do we need to improve? We've clearly, you know, you've talked about the changes we've seen um, over the past, you know, decades that we've, we've had, um, you know, these issues on college campuses and we're finally talking about these things. Um, where do we need to go from here? Legislatively, from a college standpoint, from a student perspective, um, from an education standpoint, what is one or two areas that we really need to be able to improve um, with this issue? From my experience, um it would really be community education. Um, oftentimes, when I'm working with in my campus, um, and, you know, granted, you know, you, you have some authority. You can kind of say, "No, this is what we're doing. <laughs> this is the accommodation. <laughs> Let's go." Um, where I have found, you know, really having to connect people with um, advocates in the community. Sometimes even going through a judicial route, which can be difficult if a person has not filed a police report. Um, I wish that could change. I wish you could still get some form of almost judicial support or services, even if you haven't reported the individual. Um, you can't qualify for OVS services, Office of Victim Services, um, to get that compensation, to get that help. For people who don't know, Office of Victim Services in the state of Connecticut is run through the judicial branch, and it um, actually acts as a claim center. People who have been victims of violence, who have suffered financial losses, some, they break your glasses, um, your car has been destroyed as a result of this, your apartment's been wrecked, and you do file a police report, you can put in a claim with them. And certain things they'll help you get back. And for college students um, where money is low, and those of us, again, even who, who work on the education side, we certainly didn't go into this with, with dreams of becoming rich. <laughs> we, you know, um, so, 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 so our resources are limited. Um, but I wish, I wish there was some way that if, you know, that, that people could still present themselves for help and get it. Um, and when I talk about community education, um, I kind of digress from that. But going back into that, um, my biggest challenge has been when I'm working with people who live off campus and I'm trying to help them get out of a lease. That is mm -hmm. oftentimes a big point of control. Um, people are young, they're worried about breaking leases. Um, similar to Trinity, we have a lot of people who major in things that they're going to need to go get licensed for later on. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a lot of education, a lot of health science folks, um, a lot of social workers and things like that. Um, and they want this clean record. They're very worried. Um, so you have people who stop paying rent, who are staying in apartments, um, and, and it's a huge form of manipulation. What they don't know is that if you've had a police report within a certain amount of time, you can present it and get out of the lease. Mm -hmm. So we've had students do that, and then the, the leasing company comes back and says, no, I don't have to honor this. Um, and, and we're shocked each and, you know, each and every time. We gotta go back to CCADV, work through the advocate. Um, I wish that the same onus that is on us as colleges to educate our community was out there for other people in terms of like property management, um, you know, um, community centers, just other places that may also see these folks and that also need to adhere to these rules and regulations. I wish there was way more community education about what your rights and privileges are. Um, for anybody who's questioning, hey, I didn't know this law existed, if you go to the CCADV website, they have a list of those laws that do protect you and how to access them. Great, thank you. Oh, thank you. That's really helpful. A um, couple things, resources. So, um, 
the Women and Gender Resource Action Center has done an, a lot of work over the last 20 years, but, um, but we've struggled for resources. It's much better now. Um, we're able to we've have more of a campus, more of an administrative buy-in to the work that we're doing. We're being um, taken a lot more seriously, plus the issues that we're addressing. Um, but everything costs money. Staff costs money. Resources cost money. Getting community educated costs money. Um, Green Dot costs money. So um, resources are needed there. Um, and I know that some campuses are struggling for, for many different reasons these days. Um, but this has to be a priority. I know it's a priority at Trinity, but it, it you know, it has to be a priority at every single campus and those who are doing the ground level work um, sort of in the trenches so to speak um, we need support we need we need more resources um, the other thing is uh, is to understand and I'm just going to say this sort of blatantly out there that um, people need to understand they are not entitled to people's bodies, um, that they, um, that however they were raised, whoever they are angry at, I don't care. You do not have the privilege of entitling yourself to the use or abuse of somebody else's body, spirit, and soul. That said, um, I think that back to the resources issue with some of the Title IX changes that Betsy DeVos is, is suggesting, it's gonna make it a lot more difficult for survivors and victims to come forward. One thing I'm really concerned about is the, um, is attorney's fees for those um, students who are not privileged economically, um, and there are many at Trinity and many at, at many of the colleges in Connecticut. Um, whether it's whatever side, it, I'm sorry, not side, but whichever party, whether it's the accused or the, um, or the, um, uh, thank you, <laughs> or the person bringing the complaint, um, if the other side, quote unquote, the other person, the other party has an attorney or can afford one and one party can't, that, that's unfair, that's uneven, it's, it, there's not going to be good representation of, of both sides and there's um, and I've seen students drop out of an investigation or stop an investigation for those reasons so I think there are things that are changing and that we need to um, pay very strict attention to making sure that if you're going to have due process and you really have to have fair and just um, um, systems in place and resources available for for that to happen, for fairness and justice to happen. I think you guys really covered it. Um, but I would just say, as a student, I think that there's always more that you can do, and there's always more to know, and there's always going to be people who need you to believe them and who need your support. And I think that there's always a small group of us that seem to really, really care. And I wish that that group was a little bit bigger and even more so that it's the entire campus and then outside of that the entire community because I think that a lot of this advocacy on college campuses comes from a small group it comes from the Women Gender Resource Action Center it comes from the Title IX office and you know programs like Green Dot and other student organizations but I wish that other groups on campus and everyone on campus not only was aware but actively tries to do more and to make change. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, if there was a resource that I wish we could increase, um, and this may sound strange, not for the sake of like defending, but really again to educate and provide um, greater help, would be for people who sit on the other side of this, the people who are responding to these accusations. Um, oftentimes, I mean, you're right. I'm countering people who have been taught really. Poor. They have, I wouldn't say even taught, but just they simply have very poor views of what is appropriate, of what is healthy. Um, and, and oftentimes, I think the thing that people don't want to hear, but they need to know this, 
those individuals oftentimes are shocked and surprised that this is what they've been accused of, that these allegations are happening. Um, and, and they're like, no. I mean, I, parents show up mm-hmm. bleary-eyed after driving from wherever all night to, to tell me, I didn't raise this type of person. Mm-hmm. I want you to know this can't be true. This is not what happened. And again, it's because we've got that stereotype in our mind. You're right. Mm-hmm. We've got a man in our mind. We've got a hulking, large, deranged, disheveled individual. Um, but that's not what I see. Mm-hmm. I see women, men, folks who fall all along the binary. I see folks who are large. I see folks who are small. I see folks who are popular, extremely popular. I see folks that maybe kind of sit to themselves and yeah, not too many folks have ever heard of them. Everything from student leadership all the way down to I'm a part-time student who comes here maybe two or three times a week. Um, We need to again, look for acts, not actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I think once we start doing that, we'll really be able to address our societal problems around how we treat relationships. You're right, just mm-hmm. extremely unhealthy views. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to thank you all for providing all of the information that you all have provided tonight. And I think it's going to be extremely helpful for our viewers to be able to understand all of the points that we touched upon tonight. And so I want to thank Raina, Flora, and Sam for, um, for giving us this incredible event. Um, And for all of our viewers, I want to thank you all for tuning in and also to let everyone know that tomorrow we're wrapping up our week without violence on our college campuses where we were going to our Stand With Solidarity event and that's going to be at a couple college campuses in our Hartford region that are participating in this. What we're doing is the Clothesline Project and information will be on our website about this, Um, but it honors victims and survivors um, of domestic violence, physical violence, intimate partner violence. Um, And we're doing this at Capital Community College, Trinity College, UConn Hartford, and USJ, University of St. Joseph. So uh, join us tomorrow at 12 p.m. You can go to all of their different resources. Um, They'll be going live as well. So we wanna thank you all for tuning in tonight. We hope you learned a lot and thank you all. Take care.